I'm going to try and do the following. So apropos of stereotypes, xenophobia, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, is the following. I'm going to tell you some <laughs> arguments I hear a lot, certain attitudes to migration. You may like migration, you may hate migration, but not for some of the reasons I'm going to mention. Okay? So that's one thing I'm going to try and do. Um, I'm also going to try and give you the perspective from the source countries. Okay? And so it's going to be a little bit different, maybe a little bit different from the very first talk here. And I'm also going to tell you, hopefully, some of the things we're trying to do in the field uh, for migrants. Okay? All right. So why do migrants migrate? To better their lives. Uh, human beings, as I said at the very beginning, we've all been moving around so that we can uh, seek betterment. Here is a fallacy, and sorry for putting math up here, but I just, uh, I'm going to explain what I mean by this, and you're going to see it every now. But it's a very simple argument. Um, migrants have the status quo, where they are at a particular time. They may be in Ghana, they may be in India. They decide to migrate. They go to a better place. So let your status quo be S, better place be B. Why do migrants migrate? Because B is better. Where they are currently is not as good as where they could go. Very, very simple thing. Many, of, many people, when looking at the migration decision, they look at where the migrants currently are. They say, oh, it should be something else. It could be better. They could have certain rights. They could have more income. Because they don't get these better things, all migration is bad. Many people have had those kinds of arguments with me over the years, and this is my attempt at um, <clears throat> getting back at them, okay? <laughs> so let's see how I fare, all right? So again, the, 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 the correct response, I think, is if they're going to a better situation, that's a good thing, okay? If they're going to a worse situation, migration is bad. But if they're going better, it's a good thing. We as academics, advocates, we want to make that better ideal, right? Make the better even better, all right? So that's, that's the punchline of the whole talk. I'm going to go through uh, two examples, and hopefully uh, you're going to tell me when I'm 10 minutes, those in beats. Okay, perfect. All right, just uh, keep me in check here. All right. So the first is going to be about the Arab Gulf. There was a time when I was in... Uh, I was invited to a cocktail reception. I'm sitting beside a professor uh, from a West Coast University. Professor asked me, hey, what have you been doing? I said, oh, I've been spending some time at NYU's new campus in Abu Dhabi. And uh, she says to me, oh, I hear there's some labor issues there. I say, yeah, but um, do you really want to know the truth about this, or should we talk about something else? She says, no, 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 I'm an academic. I really want to know the truth. Long and short, I tried to tell her the inside story, and maybe five minutes into that reception, this professor was screaming at me. How dare you say that this is a good thing? And it was getting embarrassing. I had to very meekishly walk away, okay? This is an example. I'm gonna go through it, and let's see whether you guys are gonna be talking to me at the end of my talk here, okay? All right, so we're talking about the uh, United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi in particular, uh, the country, I should say, uh, UAE. This is where it is. It's in a kind of rough zone. Uh, it's next door to uh, uh, Iran. Kuwait is up there. Iraq is out there. And uh, let me give you a little bit of the history of this place to set it in context. This is the place where uh, the initial product of the place was uh, dates. And as many Americans know, dates used to be a staple of Thanksgiving. Uh, we don't do it anymore, but Thanksgiving dates and dates used to come from the Orient and Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and those areas. I was interested in it because there were a lot of Africans that moved into there. This is 1912, thereabouts. Here are some pictures, Africans collecting dates. Californians come in, take some of the dates to California, and tank their industry. So it's going up and around 1933, starts its downhill decline, and that was the end of dates. The second product in that area, uh, again, these are Africans from the east coast of Africa. Uh, pearls, that was the other uh, product in that area, bringing a lot of migrants, and that's why I was interested in this. Uh, funny thing, pearls, you know, you uh, uh, tie a rope around your foot, you dive into the water, 
hold your nose, look for the pearls, and hope that by the time you run out of breath, you, you yank it and you hope your friend up there is paying attention so they rope you up very, very quickly. So um, that's how they produced pearls in those days. And um, that was a big commodity. That died because of this man who uh, invented in Japan artificial pearl cultivation. And that was the end of that industry. All around the Gulf, there were a lot of Africans there. And I should say this is Matt Hopper at uh, UCAL Poly uh, gave me those slides. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, those were the two industries, both died, the whole place was going down. A quarter of the population in many of the cities around there, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, were all Africans. That's how come, uh, that's where I was quite interested in. The place was going down until, good for them, they discovered oil. This was about 1962, they discovered oil in that, in that area. And then they had a big debate. We now have a lot of oil. What is going to be our development strategy? There were two things they could have thought of. Number one was, let's keep the oil. Let's have a small population and see if we can uh, advance using that. The other economic strategy they thought about was, let's import, import. Let's bring in a large number of immigrants to help us develop our economies. And so by 1960, this place was, uh, the whole area was essentially full of sand. Many African countries were doing much better than um, uh, the, the Gulf area. But anyway, the first leaders there in the 60s decided to have the small model without Im uh, immigration. Second set of people, let's bring in large numbers, okay? And boy, did they bring in large numbers. Today, about 83.7% of the population are non-natives, okay? So if you think of migration, this is it doesn't get better than this. If you're somebody who likes migration, I'm not saying you should, this is phenomenal, okay? Some negative parts of the migration. People were coming in from all over the world, um, from other uh, countries, uh, Europeans, Americans, a lot of Australians. Many of them were receiving very, very large wages by coming in, very, very happy. And yet there was a large segment of people who came in straight from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, okay? Their wages were relatively small, small relative to the uh, Americans and British in particular, and something which if we see, we may think is awful, okay? In addition, they come in and they live in dormitories, dorms, okay? Here are some of them. Uh, when you go to this place, you just see some of these living quarters teeming with people. And this is a famous picture from uh, The Guardian. This is The Guardian and The New York Times started having exposés about this area, okay? That it's bad, it's abusing people, uh, the wages are low, etc. Should we therefore say migration from India into the UAE should stop? Because they live in dorms, the housing is bad, the wages are relatively small. Should we be saying that? This is one of the fallacies I just mentioned. So at that cocktail party, this professor was screaming at me, they're getting slave wages. We are doing research in India right now where we are actually figuring out why people are leaving. And people are leaving because relative to India, the wages are very high, okay? Uh, the state of Kerala, which is one of the states in India, is supposed to have a, a highest literacy rate. Um, a lot of families will tell their kids to go out into the Gulf. That's the only way in which you get a wife, okay? Because uh, they come back, they build things, they have houses, they're relatively better off, okay? So anyway, that's point one. How do you make an impact? Wages are low, things are bad, okay? You do not say that because wages are low, you should just yank the uh, uh, migration channel. Instead, you try to make it better, okay? Some of the things we're doing, they have something there called the kefala system, where somebody essentially gets a visa attached to a company. That leads to abuse. It leads to what we call in economics monopsony power. Get rid of that, okay? So that there could be freedom of movement. Once somebody comes into the UAE, they can compete for more jobs. So that's one of the things with the uh, UAE Ministry of Labor we've been trying to do. The minister is receptive to the, all of that. We've written papers about the impacts of that. Every now and then, and this is a case, a journalist calls me up one day 
and says, hey, I hear you are trying to write something saying that in 2011 they relaxed these laws, wages went up as we expect them to be, and this journalist is on the phone saying, you are a bad man. Why? I'm saying something good about the Arab, Arab world. Person threatens me, you know, I'm going to write uh, an article about you saying how you are an NYU professor, they've just uh, put up a campus there, so you must be on the payroll of those uh, rich sheikhs. And so I was, of course, trembling. I, I don't want to get inside the, uh, uh, the newspapers. And so one of my co-authors is actually a, I don't know if I should say this, Suresh. Suresh Naidu is actually extreme left. So I just said, well, that's the guy who does all the number stuff. Go talk to him. <laughs> and after the journalist spoke to my uh, Marxist friend, he just uh, dropped the whole thing. Uh, the economists picked up the same thing, and I think they got it right, which is what? Which is, we are all trying to make things better, okay? They ain't great, but there are some things you can do. Introduce competition, it has a positive effect, okay? Uh, beware of ethical dilemmas. As we are asking for more movement among workers, as we are raising the wages of existing workers, the migration into the UAE is going to be less. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing, right? fewer people are going to be able to migrate. Recruitment fees are a big thing. Um, there are gains from trade. A huge part of it is being taken by recruitment firms. So that's something we are working with uh, the Indian government, the UAE government. Lam Pritchett uh, came in here, was talking about um, advocacy. There's something called the Abu Dhabi Dialogue. Let's see if I can get it here. These are all the countries in it. And they're doing exactly what he wanted uh, them to do. There's money on the table. They're funding research and they are trying to do something about labor. Uh, today, as you know, because of the Arab Spring, many of these countries are trying to hire their own people. Migration is actually now falling. Add to that the uh, reduction in the price of oil, and we actually are beginning to get worried about the continuation of this uh, migrant flow. Anyway, so that's number one, okay? Just stereotypes, and uh, nobody's screaming yet, so I think I'm doing okay. Let's try number two. Brain drain, okay? So um, what is the issue? In many uh, countries, African countries in particular, huge percentages of the skilled labor are outside the country. They are part of what is called the brain drain. Uh, in my home country, Ghana, when I looked at the data in the year around 2004, something like half of all tertiary educated Ghanaians were outside of Ghana, okay? And so you'd say that's a bad thing, okay? Uh, I remind everybody the word brain drain actually comes from the UK. A lot of British people are outside of the UK. And so if you're thinking of brain drain being bad, think of the UK. That's actually where the word first came from. This is a map of the brain drain across the world. The darker ones are the places with highest brain drain. So you see a lot of African countries there. And you also see Britain. And I think there's New Zealand in the corner as well. Okay, these are the high brain drain countries. All right, so what are the stereotypes? What are the problems? So the first thing is, everywhere I go, and I'm brain drain exhibit A, <laughs> everybody says to me, why aren't you back in your home country helping? That's what they all say. Bill is from West Virginia. Why don't you ask him that? <laughs> why doesn't he go back to West Virginia? Relative to New York, I mean, it's, it's poor as well, right? Okay, nobody ever asked him that. Why'd you ask me? When I first showed up at NYU as a professor, I loved, the econ economists love math. I was doing mathematical economics. And one of the fathers of development economics is Mike Tudaro. I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're about my age, you used his development textbook. He calls me up, he says, young man, you're African. How, why are you working on economic theory? You should be, you should be helping the starving people in, in Africa. That's what he said to me. And I was a brand new professor. I thought I wouldn't get tenure. What are the appropriate ways to think of the brain drain? Um, well, let me just add, add a few more things. Anytime I talk about this, there's leadership. I think somebody mentioned this uh, before. Social disruption, all the educated people leaving, um, shortages of skilled labor. What are the facts? As far as we can tell, when people have the incentive to leave, many people invest in education, right? And so you may actually have a large number of people invested in that education so that they can run that lottery to be able to leave, right? 
And so you may end up having more skilled people in country because they are allowed to leave than otherwise. Okay, so this is what uh, Bill and I did quite, uh, several years ago, which sort of uh, indicates that that's, that's the case. For example, if you go to many um, uh, poor countries, uh, my own Ghana included, you will find a high rate of graduate unemployment. A lot of people with uh, tertiary education are unemployed. Why would they be unemployed? Right? Answer, there is a good chance, 50% chance, that if they get the education, they'll be able to go abroad and get a high income, right? And so they're willing to take that lottery. Why are there a lot of actors and actresses in this city, unemployed, right? They're running the same lottery. They just say to themselves, you know, it's a hard job, but if I make it, I'll make it big. So they're willing to take the risk, right? Okay. Ghanaians, skilled Ghanaians, skilled people all over the world, they're doing exactly the same thing, okay? And so that's what explains that. Um, the UK decided that nurses leaving poor countries, going into the UK is a bad thing. And so the National Health Service banned the use of foreign, uh, yeah, for them foreign, primarily African, a little bit Filipino nurses, right? And you would think that that's a good thing, right? Brain drain. Nurses are needed in Africa. People are sick in Africa. What are we doing sending all the nurses from Africa into the UK? What is the reality? Go to Ghana today, there's a huge unemployment of nurses. People are now not going into the nursing profession, right? There are no jobs there, and there are no jobs abroad. And so you've got shrinking supply of nurses. Is that the right thing to do? All right. Another thing that normally comes in when we're talking about um, skilled labor is this thing about mismatch. So you always hear the expression, you have people who have high degrees in uh, uh, foreign countries, the neurosurgeon who comes to New York to be a cab driver. That's what you hear, right? Again, you remember this logical fallacy? When I was in the University of Ghana, oops, what just happened there? When I was in the University of Ghana, uh, Rollins, uh, the first Rollins administration came in, the universities were um, on the down. Several of my professors started driving taxis, university professors driving taxis. Is that a bad thing? It's the reality, right? Okay. Do you condemn them for that? You just say no. It's a reflection of something else going in the economy. The same thing with people who have high skills in their home countries, a neurosurgeon with no neurosurgery department to go to. What's so bad about them coming into the United States to make an income for their family if back home they have nothing to eat and others are rather looking after them? These are the realities on the ground that we have to be a little bit careful about when we're talking about uh, migration. And again, here's the fallacy written again. Uh, if I can just take a few more. Remittances. Remittances are great, right? And we all know that there are large remittance flows from countries like the US, OECD, going back into African nations. They're, they're huge, huge percentages relative to the GP, GDP. About three, four years ago, the NGO community started something. It was just the most bizarre thing. I was giving a talk somewhere, and all of a sudden, everybody was saying remittances are bad. Let's stop migration because remittances are awful. Why are remittances awful? The money going back to uh, the home countries are causing people to be lazy. Okay? They're, they're, they're lying in the sun and just swaying on their hammocks and uh, just chilling out. We were saying this about Africa, and Africans don't go in hammocks. Um, there's something about consumption versus investment. So the remittances go bad. People just consume it. They're not creating industries. So that has to be a bad thing. And it keeps going on. So it's, again, the same case of this fallacy, right? So there's some aspects of it which may be bad. You would prefer something which is ideal. But this is the reality. And having those remittances go through is a good thing. All right. So I think my time is up now. Um, what is my broader point? As a general rule, 
at least for the development side, for the poor countryside, having them leave from their home countries, going abroad, is usually a good thing. It's not the greatest thing. There are things that we can make that move better. And again, I'm not talking about the host countryside. I'm talking about the developing countryside. Um, let's be careful when we're criticizing it. Let's be careful of our logic. At the end of the day, I'm a big proponent of as much migration as is feasible. Um, it's part of the human spirit. It's what makes us human beings. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, that's why all of us are here, right? And so if the early Africans had put you know, uh, uh, you know, guns by the African borders, uh, none of you guys would be here. You'd all be my color, and you'd all be having a great time in Africa, wouldn't you? <laughs> Thank you very much. so that those people, if they don't win the lottery, they decide to stay and they can create their own industry. How can that help actually developing those countries? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but that's, in a sense, the story of economic development. That's what all of us are trying to figure out. Uh, when we're in our classrooms, when we're doing e uh, development economics, and that's what we're trying to do. So again, um, it's a great question. And, uh, for many countries like uh, Ghana, we're actually in a very good place. Uh, many of you may not realize that at independence, there were next to no tertiary educated people at all in Ghana, at all, okay? Even today, we say that there's a huge unemployment. The numbers are still small. When I looked at the numbers in the year 2004, the total number of um, tertiary educated Ghanaians, so the population of Ghana today is 25 million, then it was maybe about 19 million. The total number of Ghanaians all across the planet with tertiary education was about 160,000 people. The population of NYU alone is 50,000. The entire country Ghana, in Ghana, outside Ghana, 160,000. It's a small number, right? Okay, so it's actually good that today we have a large number of Ghanaians that are in the country. Uh, the economy has sort of slowed down, plateaued a little bit. Um, but they'll get there, and I think you know things are going to change. There's election coming in, and um, I'm, I'm happy that there are a lot of educated people there. I'm uh, happy that some of them are uneducated. I think um, uh, unemployed. I think the unemployment rate is something like 45 percent for you know, tertiary educated in Ghana. Okay, so it's huge. But again, that's the future. There's small numbers still, and um, I have hope. I don't know the answers. Um, my question to you, being an African man, and you're a professor, you're in the academic world, uh, all of you that are in this, like this gentleman was saying earlier, you are in this, you've been in this part of the world for a while. You see the part of Africa is always removing. We are always from slavery to now we self-enslave ourselves. That's what I'm looking at. You were saying that a lot of people are educated, they have no job. What are you trying to do? What have you tried in your part, on your own part, to improve your own country, Ghana? I'm not going to other part of Africa now. All of us are in this part of the world. We have learned something from here. How do you take what you've learned here to improve your own country for people to have job over there, to give them some kind of stability instead of migrating to other countries to help develop their country, and yours is there, people are suffering, they show us, they portray us like they, like they said, no rain, no, nothing grows there, and that's not true. You being an African, you know we, are, we live natural lives, things grow, there's rain. If you are from some, I don't know, I don't even know how to say it, I see people want to live by the water, I grew up living by the water. My house is look, overlooking the sea. I see the sea, I see the river. So all of us are here, we are already being stereotyped. 
once you're black, you're stereotyped, no matter your background. I can be a professor, I, my, my whole family can be a doctor. It doesn't matter. You're a black person, that's it. Stereotypical thing of America. If you move into one neighborhood now, the other people are going to move out. Gentrification happens all the time. What have you tried to do to improve your country? That's what I want to know. To stop these little kids from suffering, because there are so many kids that their life is not going to go anywhere without you doing something. And they go hungry every night. They sleep hungry every night, and they shouldn't be. Thank you for that, and I, I, I share the passion. Um, so let me answer that question in a different way, and maybe getting further to my point. So young Africans will come to me, and they'll say to me, Yao, I really want to help Africa. Tell me what I should go doing back in Africa. And typically, my response to them is, actually, I'd advise, stay here a little bit longer. Don't go right away, OK? There are millions of Africans in Africa doing a lot of very good work. The best things we can do, that those of us who are in the United States, is to serve as a link between the two, okay? And acquire the skills here. Acquire the learning here. When you get a little bit older, you move back. Uh, you asked me about myself. When I first came to the United States, I was in the economics department. I was doing theoretical economics. I loved it. And I stayed there for a long time. And I think I'm glad I did that, because right now I'm able to contribute to my country much, much more than if I had gone much earlier and competed with everybody else. Uh, NYU now has a study abroad campus in Accra. And uh, Angela and some of my students here, we have a, a technology center in the village, uh, in a remote area. These are all things through NYU that we're able to do in part because I know the system here. So again, particularly for the younger people, um, get the experience here. Don't, just don't go back and try and, don't be in a rush. There are lots of people there. They're taking care of things. Okay, things are not as bad as sometimes the media tells us exactly what um, uh, Bill was saying. Okay, so anyway, that's my circuitous answer to your question. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great, great um, forum uh, because it's very essential to discuss about immigration and migration, human trafficking, all those subjects. Um, under such time where we have 20 million people who are displaced. Um, having said that, um, uh, it worries me um, as an African descent of, from Ethiopia uh, that the brain drain uh, system is really eradicating um, or killing those African countries <laughs> where um, uh, someone has to write a book soon, uh, probably title it that how Europeans and the African dictators underdeveloped Africa. Um, I would hope so. Um, having said that, uh, why, why are we uh, actually applauding this, uh, this brain drain system? UK perhaps could be able to do that because it already has developed. They can afford to release their experts to go anywhere. But Africa is still underdeveloped. Um, uh, and there's a huge issue in the human rights uh, area. Those levers in those countries, Arab countries, five or six of them in, in the Middle East, especially in the map that you showed, um, they, are, they, they have been treated below the standard human rights um, uh, of labor, uh, international labor. And that is not right. So shouldn't we focus? Uh, it's, it's kind of related to her question. Shouldn't we focus in um, working what's the root cause of the migration? Because as we see, even here in the developed country, in the United States of America, see the stereotype uh, that Professor uh, Esterly mentioned, uh, taught us today, that um, people being treated like, you know, all kinds of names being called, which I don't want to repeat that. And uh, I don't think that's fair. I don't think a person with an, a PhD degree drive a cab. This is just under, uh, you know, allocating his, 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 his knowledge, human capital. He could have expended it in, in his country or even here 
if there was the opportunity. So Thank would you please uh, go over uh, what the root cause of these problems, how we, your recommendations would be? Yeah. So, so let me answer, it's not gonna be a full answer. I understand the, you know, the, 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 the story of Ethiopia. I've actually done quite a bit of work in Ethiopia. Let me just give you two examples. And so one of the best airlines in uh, Africa today is Ethiopian Airlines. And do you know the story of how Ethiopian Airlines got to be where it is? Um, Ethiopian Airlines was started by TWA. I don't know if you were my age, you remember TWA. It used to be a great airline, it went under. And what they did was, when the airline was starting, unlike Ghana Airways, Air Africa, and many of the other African airlines, they decided to partner with TWA. So it was a long-term strategy where TWA begins, they sent some Ethiopians into uh, the United States, trained them, they lost some of them to the brain drain, but some of them went back. And so there was a system where after a while, the uh, people, the management, everything, slowly turned in a very, very sustainable way, okay? And today, as I said, Ethiopian Airlines is great. Ghana Airways, which did the opposite uh, method, is defunct, and there are many other uh, airlines like that. The second example, of course, is the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange. You may like the exchange, you may hate the exchange, but their model was exactly the same. They uh, went to the diaspora, people who are highly skilled Ethiopians in the United States, they enticed them to go back, start the Commodities Exchange, get it going, and then slowly bring in non-diaspora people. And so it's an institution, it's been in existence for eight years, you may or may not like it, but it's a great model, okay? So again, all the other things you said, I'm, I'm with you, I understand the human rights issues that are going on there, but I just, there's a talk about migration and the brain drain, and that's, that's my take on it, okay? Because this country, the Ethiopian yeah. government that you're praising right uh, now. The, I, 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 I didn't no, praise the Ethiopian said, government. It, it, currently, there's genocide that's going on, human rights violation, yeah. and the whole world is ignoring what's going on, okay? Let's be realistic here. And what I'm trying to say is academically, yes, you, you're entitled to think that way, but there is a reality issue right now that's going on. So uh, let's be, and this government is allowing people to go, 1,500 people legally getting out of the country, migrants. But what happens in Saudi Arabia to those girls, to those women, to those guys, you know what happens. Some of them die on the way to um, Saudi Arabia to get liberated. So it's <coughs> not fun. Yeah, we need to do something about it. Thank you. Can I, can I ask my question? Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, dear professor. Um, and uh, we, we worry about Africa and its development for these migrant peoples. And uh, what do you think about the development that, that China has offered Africa and uh, through the BRICS uh, block, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, and what they call the One Belt Maritime Road? And I, I'm glad you brought up uh, the Ethiopian Airlines because also we have the China Railroad from Djibouti to Addis Ababa, which has helped uh, save the lives of hundreds of thousands of people by bringing them food and stuff. And maybe one day it'll go all the way to Senegal. So um, can we get the US involved in these development projects back in our old Hamiltonian tradition? Because uh, I've been working with the LaRouche Political Action Committee to organize for this in the United States. So how do we help the migrants to get into development projects? And maybe some of us can migrate to the third world to help development. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, all, all good points, and uh, the only th I'll make two very quick. We've got you know, uh, several people here, and I'm told the time is, is running out. Sorry. Quick comments. In terms of uh, infrastructure development, having China be um, part of the mix, excellent idea. Uh, this is a conference on migration, and many of you may not realize the extent of Chinese migration into Africa, into sub-Saharan Africa. These are large numbers, a uh, million, two million. Um, I go to the village in the middle of nowhere and you see a Chinese man there in the retail business. You're on the flight going from Accra into one of the smaller towns. The plane is full of Chinese people. So that's one of the very, very interesting things and I like it because it's shown, and again, just as Bill said, uh, Africa is not as bad as people portray it. People are leaving from China to come to Africa. So let me just, we've got two more here and I'm told that the time is, is running, so go ahead. Hi. Um, Short questions if you, can, if you don't mind. Yeah. We were talking about how um, migrants are migrating because it's at least incrementally better than where they're coming from. And from an economic perspective, that's always better. 
Um, but I'm wondering if there is some sort of lower limit from a human rights perspective of how bad the, the uh, conditions can be um, for you personally where it's still not better for them. Yeah, so, so again, those are, those are subjective things and these are some of the things that I feel somewhat strongly about. Um, you know, many of you may not know this, but uh, my parents were migrants. They, le they left from the, the UK, uh, from Ghana into the UK. My father didn't see his mother for nine years, okay? All right? Um, life is hard in poor countries. It's very hard, okay? Um, the people who are leaving from India to go into the UAE, many of them have no jobs, no incomes. You look at them going into, into um, from India, going into the UAE, uh, you, you can see their cheekbones, okay? They're hungry, all right? So when they show up into the UAE, they have food. They're sending money back. That, that small amount of money I just mentioned, some of it goes back to parents to, to feed them in the rural areas. So we as outsiders, when we are watching, looking at this thing, we cannot use our own standards, okay? It's, 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 it's not right. You're not living their lives, okay? And so if somebody says that it's in my interest to leave from my country, got um, some of uh, those of you who are NYU Abu Dhabi, some of our staff leave from Kenya, they go into uh, Abu Dhabi for what we would consider small amounts of money. They don't see their families for a year, two years, three years, right? And they come because for them it's worth it. So we have to be careful of this moral judgment. Like we have no right living in this society to dictate what is good and not good for somebody else. It's not right. And for you to say you're going to deny somebody food on their table because it's not enough food, that's also a logical fallacy. <coughs> Ambassador, that's going to be that. Go ahead, Ambassador. Oh, yeah. uh, please. Ambassador, go ahead. You've already had your time. We want to mix it up. No, All right. Okay. Ambassador, thank, go ahead. But thank you very much. I apologize for being yep. late, and I hope that what I'm about to ask you has not already been answered by others. But uh, I've always been fascinated by the uh, linkage between migration and colonization. As we prepare to uh, colonize Mars, maybe, uh, <laughs> we should keep in mind, uh, for example, that uh, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico, and other parts of this great nation were once part of Mexico. So while we uh, tend to, or some of us, tend to uh, demonize uh, migrants, uh, we might try to remember some of that history. Uh, even Hawaii was, uh, was colonized by migrants from the outside. And uh, I just wonder if you or any of the other uh, panelists uh, gave any uh, thought or presentation to that linkage. And I'm particularly concerned because now in the future, we are going to see mass migrations from low-lying island countries and low-lying coastal countries because of climate change. The, the hoax that the Groper in chief would have us believe uh, doesn't exist but it does, and there's going to be a massive migration from there. I, I, don't, I wonder if you've given any thought to that today. Yeah, maybe I should ask the other um, uh, speakers if they have any thoughts. I mean, um, Ambassador, as many of you know, Ambassador Van Lirup, is, um, he writes a lot about uh, uh, migration. I've seen some of his uh, work on that. Um, no, I haven't thought about that connection. I mean, frankly, anytime I see the words colonial and migration, I'm thinking of when the British were going into South Africa, you know, during the Diamond Rush and Cecil Rhodes, and you know, it was British policy to send, you know, all the people who were uh, troublemakers. Um, isn't Australia the place where all the guys who were the prisoners went in there? I mean, it's it's the world is full of uh, migration, and that's that's what comes to my mind when I think of uh, uh, colonialism.